By now, everybody knows about what's happening in the Ukraine. It is really devastating and uh, really heartbreaking what's happening. My heart goes to everybody there. I hope everybody stays safe. But what is going on also behind the scene, uh, a part of the physical invasion is, is, is actually a cyber war that most of you are aware of. And uh, I'd like to discuss the technicality of this cyber war uh, specifically just talking about the denial of service or or the dos attacks or the ddos attacks so i'm going to talk about all the different types that the russian military is effectively using to target critical infrastructures in the ukraine military infrastructure to be specific uh, using these denial of service so just to educate ourselves about these kind of different denial of service attacks how about we jump into it the simplest definition that i'd like to use for denial of service attack is what can an attacker do that is really a minimum to effectively disable a backend from serving other customers that is the simplest definition but what does it really mean to deny a service the goal here is to exhaust resources on the back end that is server cpu memory bit network bandwidth uh, so that nobody can use this back end at all so how can this actually happen so in this video i'm going to outline six ways where a denial of service can actually happen so the first one, having a long running process on the back end. So I, as an attacker, if I sent a simple request that I know to your API, that I know is going to take a long time to process, this is a sign of a possible denial of service. Because if I send a request that is so tiny and you keep spinning on the back end to process that, when you have a process that is running on the background, you know, that consumes CPU, that consumes memory, that can starve other requests from possibly getting served. And that's the key here. If you have a thousand of these requests executed at the same time, the backend will be saturated, obviously. So that's one way. So when I say long running processes, I could mean half a second, three seconds, or even a minute, or even more than that. One example of a long running process slash request attack is uh, something called slow Loris attack, where the attacker will establish a TCP connection to the backend, but it will take its sweet time to actually send the request. So the request is, it's not really large, but it will send it byte by byte. So the, the server will wait for the call request to be received but that time is so precious because it could be used to serve other requests so if you spin up multiple requests like that you can effectively take a lot of memory on the back end so watch out for if you're building an api on the back end watch out for requests that takes a long time and even if that's by design, just watch out for that. Don't let anyone just execute that. So the second type of the you know, service is find a way to crash a backend process. And that usually comes from a vulnerability. We've seen Node.js, OpenSSL, so many other software patches these problems because they are the most dangerous, really, because they require literally no work. Uh, you don't really need a distributed denial of service attack. You know, it's just one attacker can take down the entire process, you know, backend by effectively crafting a special request that they know that this is going to land on the backend. It will be processed in a malicious way and a crash. And when it crashes, the process goes down, then the cold start of that process will be so slow to pick up the uh, to pick up in order to serve other requests so crashing processes are really the most dangerous denial of service attacks number three exhausting the maximum number of tcp connection that you can establish on a single box on a single server uh, the maximum number that i have seen in the wild uh, reported is by whatsapp and that is a three million tcp connection per box right and that's the maximum that i've i've seen so that's the the maximum beefiest server and we can handle that after that you still start seeing things drop so if you have an attacker with enough 
power and enough distributed and he has all sorts of zombie uh, IoT devices that to connect to a backend and saturate it then you can take it down right obviously with load balancers it's it's really hard to do that but remember the load balancer is nothing but another single box unless you're doing layer 3 load balancing at that lower tier you know and VRRP and uh, GeoDNS but effectively that's a, that's the same thing so you can saturate the number of TCP connection in a single box that's another denial of service attack so a little bit harder but it can happen number four large responses so this request is tiny but the response is designed to be large and boy we have seen in my diff tooling series how large unnecessarily really large web traffic really is so you would establish a tcp connection to the backend you would establish a tls connection you know on top to encrypt it and then you would just do a get request and sometimes these the the payload the initial payload is in in the high number of megabytes you know 1.5 sometimes 600 kilobytes on it on an average one and that's really because of the bloat of the web that we have today and that's just a side effect of the frameworks and the really leaky abstraction that we we use a library and we don't know how it works and all of a sudden we see a three megabyte size that we have to deal with just because we want to use a one function that that's really a problem and we if we really think really hard we can make the web much slimmer but um, unfortunately uh, this is really a losing battle at this time I i'm tired of saying this <laughs> the problem really with trading performance and efficiency for less line of code that's the questions we're trying to answer how can i oh this is a lot of code i can i want to write this whole thing in one line of code that's all what we're trying to answer and when we do that the cost is leaky abstractions the cost is in terms of uh, large file sizes uh, unnecessary cpu you know usage and network bandwidth and we really need to understand more things but that's another topic for another day and that's where really is happening on the ukraine according to security now https web responses are the attacks that is currently happening one of the most at least so let's send a single request and if we get a large response you just occupied a little bit of processing power on the back end a little bit of a memory to uh, to to fill the buffer and obviously some bandwidth network bandwidth to actually ship this and this is this translates to uh, the mtus which translates to uh, the maximum mss the maximum segment size in the tcp and how many tcp segments you need to ship and all all really depends on the uh, the window size of the receiver so there is a lot of stuff that is happening that the the, the back end server really needs to take care of so it is expensive yeah you send one small request and all of this work needs to happen imagine this happening thousands and thousands of times the back end will go down number five lots of requests so if you have a fleet of zombie machines that you can direct to execute simultaneously on the back end on a single back end you you may be able to take it down it's not really easy obviously you might say oh if if i am from these known machines sending all these requests they can be easily blocked right but there's something called sin flooding and dns flooding and ip spoofing which is really harder to do but effectively we you would you would talk to other servers that are not your target and you say hey i want to establish a tcp connection and you send a sin request you know that's the first that's the first segment you know uh, that's part of the three-way handshake and you say hey this is hey i want to establish a tcp connection but you spoof your ip address to be the target the victim right instead of you as an attacker so the the the, the this legitimate server that you're trying to connect to you trick to connect to will respond back with the synac to the victim and imagine having all these legitimate servers talking to one node that's what breaks it down sin flooding attacks is not easy to execute because uh, your isp will see that you're you're trying to spoof right because hey this is not your source ip address what are you doing right so they will isps sometimes and you know transparent proxies will block these attempts and the final one six complex request so 
uh, one example of this is regex request, you know, things that require certain processing. And uh, you might file this under the long running processes, but these complex requests that requires special attention and a lot of CPU power can take, can make your request spin up and make the CPU busy just executing that. If you do a lot of these harmful regex requests or any type of request that requires certain processing power. So if you send a few number of these requests that requires large number of CPU, be, be careful of these CPU bound requests, then the backend will starve. Flip of this is having a request that does large IO, right? So that could be an unbounded query to the database, you know, that scans a large number of, you know, tables or large number of rows and tries to pull all of them. That's just a bad idea. Never let the, never let the, the client is really the most important thing. The client is the one that can take the backend, you know, SQLs, you know, large CPU bound, anything that is IO bound of the application, the backend itself, because it's talking to the database, effectively the database becomes either IO or it could be CPU bound. So yeah, looking at the backend, your IO bound because you're talking to a network, you're sending a network request uh, to execute a SQL on a database node, but your query is has an order by that is not using an index that has to join other tables and need to be using hash joins and you need to sort. This requires CPU. It has nothing to do with IO. Right? I'm not just reading from disk and just shipping it to you. That is CPU bound, right? So that's that's why the database becomes a CPU bound, even when the app on the back end is actually IO bound. So all of this, you know, contribute to denial of service attacks. Now that we have discussed the six different ways to do a denial of service attacks, attackers can add the distributed dimension to this and make it a DDoS attack and use any of these six methods to effectively exacerbate the effect on the backend. So how do you prevent denial of service attacks? You know, just watching out when you design an API, always watch out for what kind of request that might take a long time to process, might take a long time might be complex, right? Might be CPU bound, might be IO bound. Watch out for those. Try to block them. Try to do uh, uh, API rate limiting. Try to install an API gateway as much as possible. Uh, think about timeouts. I talk about timeouts so many times on my channel here. Uh, and I check out my course, nginx.hussainnasso.com to learn more about how do you configure timeouts in, in the entire stack at the request level, at the response level, at the database level? All of these really matter because you don't want, if, if a request is taking a certain amount of time, you want to kill it, you know? You want to release that request unless it's legitimate, which is you really need to think the, your strategy when it comes to long-running processes, if you can't do anything about it, right? And, uh, and finally, you can use uh, services layer 7 reverse proxy dose mitigation uh, like Cloudflare, uh, where, where they receive the traffic first, right? So you have your DNS points to a Cloudflare server, and they will terminate TLS. That means they can see everything that you're back and see. Some people are not comfortable with that. You know, and they look at the traffic and they try to understand if this is a malicious or not, right? And then turn around and send the request to your backend, right? So they can stop it right there, effectively. Uh, some services do not require complete layer seven. You know, they, they can go up to layer four and they only look at the TCP, but there's not enough information there. There's just the IP address and the port. So there is no really much information. The content itself, is what carries this information. Obviously, not all denial of service attack can be detected like a crash. You know, how would you know that something is going to crash? It's a legitimate request, but you sent it maliciously. All right, guys, that's it for today. I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.